I want to be explicit. Yes, the British people voted to leave Europe, and I agree the will of the people should prevail. I accept right now there is no widespread appetite to rethink. But the people voted without knowledge of the terms of Brexit. As these terms become clear, it is their right to change their mind. Our mission is to persuade them to do so. What was unfortunately only dim in our sight before the referendum is now in plain sight. The road we're going down is not simply hard Brexit. It is now Brexit at any cost. Our challenge is to expose relentlessly what that cost is, to show how the decision was based on imperfect knowledge, which will now become informed knowledge, to calculate in easy to understand ways how proceeding will cause real damage to our country, and to build support for finding a way out from the present rush over the cliff's edge. I don't know if we can succeed, but I do know we will suffer a rancorous verdict from future generations if we don't try. How hideously in this debate is the mantle of patriotism abused? We do not argue for Britain in Europe because we are citizens of nowhere. We argue for it precisely because we are proud citizens of this country, Britain, who believe that in the 21st century, we should maintain our partnership with the biggest political union, the largest commercial market on our doorstep, not in diminution of our national interest, but in satisfaction of it. Consider for a moment the surreal situation in which our na nation finds itself. I make no personal criticism of the Prime Minister or the government. I know the Prime Minister is someone who cares about our country, who's trying to do the right thing as she sees it, and I know how demanding the job of leadership is. But just consider, nine months ago, both she and the Chancellor were telling us that leaving would be bad for the country, its economy, its security, its place in the world. Today, it is apparently a once-in-a-generation opportunity for greatness. Seven months ago, after the referendum, after the referendum result, the Chancellor was telling us that leaving the single market would be, and I quote, catastrophic. Now it appears we will leave the single market and the customs union, and he is very optimistic. <laughs> Two years ago, the Foreign Secretary was emphatically in favor of the single market. Now ditching it is brilliant. The Prime Minister says, she wants Britain to be a great open trading nation. Our first step in this endeavor, to leave the largest free trading bloc in the world. She wants Britain to be a bridge between the European Union and the United States of America. How to begin this worthy undertaking to get out of Europe, thus leaving us with no locus on the terrain where the bridge must be constructed. We're told that it's high time that our capitalism became fairer and how do we start laying the foundation for such a noble cause? By threatening Europe with a move to a low-tax, light-regulation economy, the antithesis of that cause. This jumble of contradictions shows that the Prime Minister and government are not masters of this situation. They're not driving this bus. They're being driven. And as we pass each milestone, so the landscape in which we are operating changes, not because we've willed the change, but because this is the direction in which the bus is traveling. We will trigger Article 50, not because we now know our destination, but because the politics of not doing so would alienate those driving the bus. And the surreal nature of this exercise is enhanced by the curious absence of a big argument as to why this continues to be a good idea. 
Many of the main themes of the Brexit campaign barely survived the first weekend after the vote. Remember the £350 million a week extra for the NHS? Virtually the only practical argument still advanced under the general rubric of taking back control are immigration and the European Court of Justice. On the European Court, I would defy anyone to be able to recall any decisions which they might have heard of as opposed to the decisions of the European Court on Human Rights, a non-EU body. I can honestly say that during all my time as Prime Minister, there was no major domestic law that I wanted to pass which Europe told me I couldn't. It is true, European court rulings are important on technical issues. Some business likes, some they don't. But no one would seriously argue that the ECJ alone provides a reason for leaving Europe. No, immigration is the issue. Net immigration into the UK was roughly 335,000 in the year to June 2016. But just over half was from outside the European Union. I know in some parts of the country there is a real concern about numbers from Europe and the pressures placed on services and wages. However, of these European Union immigrants, the Prime Minister has recently admitted we would want to keep the majority including those with a confirmed job offer and students. This leaves around 80,000 who come looking for work but without a job. Of these 80,000, a third comes to London, mostly ending up working in the food processing and hospitality sectors. It is highly unlikely, frankly, that they're taking the jobs of British-born people in other parts of the country. So the practical impact of Brexit on immigration is on analysis less than 12% of the immigration total. And for many people, the core immigration question, and one which I fully accept is a substantial issue, is immigration from non-European countries, especially when from different cultures in which assimilation and even potential security threats could be an issue. Yet, this immigration impacted the Brexit decision. It was Donald Trump, no less, who said that without the refugees from Syria, I quote, you probably wouldn't have a Brexit. It is no coincidence that the infamous immigration poster of Leave was a picture of Mr. Farage in front of a line of Syrian refugees. Thus, we have moved in a few months from a debate about what sort of Brexit involving a balanced consideration of all the different possibilities to the primacy of one consideration, namely controlling immigration, without any real discussion as to why, and when Brexit doesn't affect the immigration people most care about. However, we're told we just have to stop debating Brexit and just do it. I would actually question whether the referendum really provides a mandate for Brexit at any cost. But suppose it does. The argument is then that the British people have spoken, we must deliver their will, and we should just get on with it. And I agree that getting on with it is a very powerful sentiment, and at present, the predominant sentiment. But were we to be true to the concept of government through British parliamentary democracy, rather than government by one-off plebiscite, we would also feel obliged to point out that it isn't a question of just getting on with it. This is not a decision that once made is a mere matter of mechanics to implement. It is a decision which begets other decisions. Every part of this negotiation from money to access to post-Brexit arrangements is itself an immense decision with consequence. If we were in a rational world, we would all the time, as we approach these decisions, be asking why are we doing this? And as we know more of the costs, is the pain worth the gain? So let's examine the pain. We will withdraw from the single market. 
which is around half of our trade in goods and services. We will also now leave the customs union covering trade with countries like Turkey. Then we need to replace over 50 preferential trade agreements we have via our membership of the European Union, for instance, with Switzerland. So EU-related trade is actually two-thirds of the total. This impacts everything from airline travel to financial services to manufacturing industry, sector by sector. Then we will pay for previous EU obligations, but not benefit from future opportunities, with figures as high as 60 billion pounds as the cost. We will lose influence in the world's most significant political union and have to negotiate on issues like the environment, where we presently benefit from Europe's collective strength on our own. There is alarm across sectors as diverse as scientific research and culture as European funding is withdrawn. And all this then to do an intricate renegotiation of the trading arrangements we have just abandoned. That negotiation is without precedent in complexity. It is even possible that it fails and that we end up trading on WTO rules. This is in itself another minefield. We would need to renegotiate the removal not just of tariff barriers, but the prevention of non-tariff barriers, which today are often the biggest impediment to trade and pile costs on business. This could take years. Our currency is down around 12% against the euro, 20% against the dollar, which is the international financial market's assessment of our future prosperity, i.e. we're going to be poorer. The price of imported goods in the supermarkets is up, and that's the cost of living. Now, of course, Britain can and would survive out of the European Union. This is a great country with resilient and creative people. And yes, no one is going to write us off, nor should they. But making the best of a bad job doesn't alter the fact that it isn't smart to put yourself in that position unless you have to. Most extraordinary of all, the two great achievements of British diplomacy of the last decades in Europe, supported by governments, both Labour and Conservative, namely the single market and European enlargement, are now apparently the two things we most regret and want to rid ourselves of. The single market, so we're clear, has been of enormous benefit to the UK, bringing billions of pounds of wealth, hundreds of thousands of jobs and major investment opportunities. Our trade with an enlarged European Union has meant, for example, that trade with Poland has gone from three billion pounds in 2004 to 13 and a half billion in 2016. Nations that came out of the Soviet bloc have seen themselves safely within the EU and then NATO, so enhancing our own security. In addition to all of this, there is the possibility of the breakup of the UK, narrowly avoided by the result of the Scottish referendum, but now back on the table, but this time with a context much more credible for the independence case. We are already seeing the destabilizing impact of negotiation over border arrangements on the Northern Ireland peace process. So none of this ignores the challenges the country faces which stoked the anger fueling Brexit. Those left behind by globalization. The aftermath of the financial crisis, stagnant incomes for some families, and for sure the pressures posed by big increases in migration, which make perfectly reasonable people anxious and feeling their anxiety unheard. I always believe that if the center ground does not deal with the problems, the extremes can exploit them. But our duty, surely, is to give answers, not ride the anger. And here is the paradox. 
as we go through this unique experiment in diplomatic and economic complexity, the entire focus of the government is on one issue, Brexit. This is a government for Brexit, of Brexit, and dominated by Brexit. It is a mono-purpose political entity. And nothing else, therefore, truly matters. Not the NHS, now in its most severe crisis since its creation. Not the real challenge of the modern economy, which is the new technological revolutions of artificial intelligence and big data. Not the upgrade of our education system to prepare people for this new world. Not investment in communities left behind by globalization. Not the rising burden of serious crime or bulging prison populations or social care. Not even, irony of ironies, a genuine policy to control immigration. You see, government's priorities are not really defined by white papers or words, but by the intensity of focus. This government has bandwidth only for one thing, Brexit. It is the waking thought, the daily grind, the meditation before sleep, and the stuff of its dreams or nightmares. It is obsessed with Brexit because it has to be. Future historians will be scurrying to investigate the antecedents of these migrants from Europe, for whose restraint we were willing to sacrifice so much. And what will they find? That they were a terrible group of people who threatened our country's stability? They will find that on the whole, they were well behaved, worked hard, paid their taxes, and were a net economic benefit. So this is the surreal situation. The question is, what do we do? The Leave campaign was a coalition. Some against Europe for economic reasons, some for cultural reasons. Some were ideological in their opposition. Some had done a cost-benefit analysis and concluded better out than in. We must expose the agenda of the ideologues and persuade those interested in the cost-benefit ratio. For the latter, we must day in, day out, articulate the reality. The pain is large and the gain largely illusory. But the ideologues are the ones driving this bus. The economic future, which could work outside of Europe, is exactly the low tax, right, right, light regulation, offshore, free market hub, with which Mrs. May threatens our European neighbors, but which to the Brexit ideologues is actually a promise of things to come. Indeed, this is what many in business say they're being told by government ministers, but of course behind the hand, because this is the exact opposite of what the mass of voters are being told when promised a fairer capitalism with a better deal for the workers. This free market vision would require major restructuring of the British economy and its tax and welfare system. It will not mean more money for the NHS, but less. Actually, it probably means a wholesale rebalancing of our health care towards one based on private as much as public provision. It will not mean more protection for workers, but less. And if that were what we wanted to do as a country, we could do it now. Europe wouldn't stop us. But as of now, the British people would, because they wouldn't vote for it. So the ideologues know that they have to get Brexit first, then tell us this is the only future which works, and by that time, they will be right. In defeating them, we've got two major challenges. There is an effective cartel of media on the right, which built the ramp for pro-Brexit propaganda during the campaign, is now equally savage in its efforts to say that it's all going to be great, and anyone who says otherwise is a traitor or a moaner, and who make it very clear to the Prime Minister 
that she has their adulation for exactly as long as she delivers Brexit. It hugely skews the broadcast coverage, I'm afraid. For example, a week ago, there was the annual survey of top uh, British business, the leading UK companies. Over half said Brexit was already having an adverse effect on their business, and half did not have confidence in the government negotiating a good deal. It led the Financial Times. It was barely covered elsewhere. The BBC had it as an item of business news. Supposing the survey had come to the opposite conclusion, it would have had at least four papers headlining it, and it would therefore have featured prominently on the broadcasts. That's one challenge. The second challenge is the absence of an opposition which looks, on the polling, capable of beating the government. The debilitation of the Labour Party is the facilitator of Brexit. I hate to say that, but it's true. So what this means is that we have to build a movement which stretches across party lines and build and devise new ways of communication. There are lots of different groups doing great work, Open Britain naturally being one. These groups have got to find ways of concerting strategy and tactics effectively. We should begin to create informal links immediately and then build them into a movement with weight and reach. We need to strengthen the hands of the MPs who are with us and let those against know they have serious opposition to Brexit at any cost. The institute which I am setting up will play our part we're creating a policy platform wider than the Europe question. There is an urgent need to reposition the whole debate around globalization and how we make it work for people. In this sense, the Brexit debate is something which is part of a much bigger debate. But developing the arguments around Brexit will be an important element of the Institute's work. <coughs> then together we need strong links with the rest of Europe. You see, if our government were conducting a negotiation which genuinely sought to advance our country's interests, that negotiation would include the possibility of Britain staying in a reformed Europe. It's clear the sentiment which led to Brexit is not confined to the UK. There is a widespread yearning for reform across Europe. Part of our work, therefore, should be to help build European-wide alliances to give voice and effect to such an impulse. So this movement must have many dimensions to it. It requires arguments of detail and arguments of grandeur. The case for Europe remains rooted not in understanding the past but the future. All over the globe, countries are coming together in regional alliances for a very simple reason. As China rises, as India and other large population countries follow, and with the USA already so powerful, so to maintain strength and influence to defend our interests adequately, nations of our size will cooperate based on proximity. This is true of the nations of Europe. But for Europe, there is a more profound reason. The transatlantic alliance is needed more than ever. But how much stronger it is with Britain in Europe and Europe an equal partner with America? Forget the short-term electoral politics there or here. In the long term, this is essentially an alliance of values, liberty, democracy, the rule of law. As the world changes and opens up across boundaries of nation and culture, which values will govern the 21st century? Today, for the first time in my adult life, it is not clear that the resolution of this question will be benign. 
Britain, because of its history, alliances, and character, has a unique role to play in ensuring it is. How, therefore, can it be wise for us during this epic period of global evolution to be focused not on how we build partnerships, but on how we dissolve the one to which we are bound by ties of geography, trade, shared values, and common interest? The one incontrovertible characteristic of politics today is its propensity for revolt. The Brexiteers were the beneficiaries of this wave, but now they want to freeze it to a day in June 2016. They will say the will of the people can't alter. It can. They will say leaving is inevitable. It isn't. They will say we don't represent the people. We do. Many millions of them, and with determination, many millions more. They will claim we're dividing the country by making the claim and the case. It is they who divide our country. Generation from generation, north from south, Scotland from England. Those born here, from those who came to our country, precisely because of what they thought it stood for and what they admired. So, this is not the time for retreat, indifference, or despair, but the time to rise up in defense of what we believe, calmly, patiently, winning the argument by the force of argument, but without fear, and with the conviction that we act in the true interests of Britain. Thank you. Well, Tony, I'd like to thank you for that uh, very thought-provoking speech. Um, I'm Pat McFadden, the MP for Wolverhampton South East and a founding supporter of Open Britain. We're going to have some questions from the audience in a moment, but I'd like to begin uh, by asking you about a couple of things that you talked about today, Tony. The first is that in a constituency like mine in Wolverhampton, a big part of the impetus to vote leave is what has been termed as the uh, discontents over globalization. People feeling left out of economic change, disaffected by politics, and feeling that often the past seemed to offer a better economy or seemed to be a better economy than the present that they're living in. Around the world, the right has offered answers to these discontents through nationalism, through anti-globalization politics, and in some cases, anti-immigrant politics. So the first thing I'd like to ask you about is if the answer from the right is wrong, what is the better answer from the center left? And secondly, if I may, on Scotland. You talked today about how the Brexit vote has put the issue of the unity of the UK back in the agenda, but you went further. You said that in some ways, that case may be more credible now. Could you say a bit more about that too? Sure, I mean, the, the first question is, you know, the heart of, of Western politics today. But you see, the answers of the right, or the far right, are not really answers. So when they say that actually protectionism is better than free trade, this is not in the end going to protect people's jobs because actually the changes that are happening in the jobs market are changes more driven by technology than it is by trade. And the next generation of technology is going to change things even to a greater extent. So we've got to, we've got to provide the genuine answers rather than riding the anger. And this is, what, uh, this is the reason I'm establishing this institute. It'll go broader than Europe. But of course, the Europe debate is, is a part of it. 
I mean, the truth is the answer to communities left behind by globalization is not for Britain to get out of Europe. It's for Britain to stay in Europe and argue for policies from Europe which allow Europe to make the best of its opportunities and within Britain to say if there are communities left behind by globalization, let's go and help them. I mean, it's, not, it's not new, this idea that, that you know, industrial change is happening. I remember back in the 60s, the whole reason there were new towns created all over the UK was because there was a huge displacement of people. So let's go to those communities and help them. They're not going to be helped. Someone who's you know, working class person in the north of England unable to get a job is not going to be helped by stopping some Polish guy working as a waiter in London. It's, it's, it's not, it, and it's, it's this false perspective we've got to uh, expose for people. At the same time, by the way, as dealing with what are genuine concerns around issues like immigration. You know, you can't ignore those issues. You've got to, you've got to deal with them, but provide the answers, not, not the, the anger. And remember, because I think this is so <coughs> crucial, is that globalization can be, to some degree, somewhat slowed down by government. Globalization can be, in some degree, somewhat facilitated by government. But globalization is a force. It's not, it's not a policy of government. Right? It's driven by technology and travel. And it's going to carry on. The world's going to move closer together. This is what will happen. So we need to make sense of that rather than seeking for someone to blame, whether it's the left wanting to blame business or the right wanting to blame migrants. On Scotland, let me be, be very clear. I want Scotland to remain in the UK, even if Brexit goes ahead. I'm still in favor of Scotland remaining in the UK. And let's be very clear, Scotland's single market with England is of far greater importance to it economically than Scotland's um, interaction with the rest of Europe. However, I'm afraid, as we said during the referendum campaign, we can't, you know, unlike the other side, uh, we don't want to unsay the things we said. Um, during the course of that campaign. So when myself and John Major warned this would be a threat to the UK, we meant it. And it's true. And you can see that by the referendum coming back on the agenda. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn to the audience now and we'll take uh, a few questions, uh, if we may. I will take three now. I will start with the gentleman in the middle there. And there's a lady over there, and then the gentleman in the middle here. So we'll go, we'll start over here with you, sir, yes. spending to the EU average. Um, I think the, the high point of effectiveness for the NHS, and we now see you know, a, a retreat from that, and we see what that's meaning. Specifically, though, uh, the NHS and social care is experiencing huge shortages in clinical staff and, uh, and social care staff, particularly. Um, uh, midwives are a good example of that, huge shortage of midwives in, in this country. Um, I wonder what advice you would have for Theresa May um, about all of those people, like our members, like midwives, who are currently under threat, um, wondering about whether they and their families have to leave this country, and also for the future, because it's not just about those people now, it's about the needs of health and social care in the future. Yep. Okay, thank, thank you, you, sir. Maybe there was a lady over here. Yeah. Hi, uh, Heather Glass. I'm from a group called Lambeth for Europe. We're a grassroots group of, of pro-European campaigners in Lambeth. Um, and as you heard from Antoinette earlier, there's a lot of us still out there, still fighting as hard as we can to, for, a, for a positive future relationship with Europe. <coughs> Many of us would dearly love the UK to remain in the, in the EU. Um, others would, would like to see a, a positive post-Brexit relationship of, of some sort, but, but we're all very, very passionate about this cause. I'd be really interested in your thoughts on how we can most productively focus our efforts in that direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And finally, the gentleman in the middle. Uh, good morning. Alex Thompson, Channel 4 News. Um, as you'll be well aware, your critics will say this occasion is somewhat ironic, and they would accuse you of being one of the key architects of Brexit because your successive governments 
oversaw uh, a, situa a situation of mass immigration into this country from the EU, over which, by the nature of it, um, your government had no control, and they would accuse you of, during successive governments, not being straight with the British people about that. Okay, um, you know, stand-ups probably, otherwise I'll get blocked out a bit. Um, so on the first question from a colleague from the Royal College of Midwives, I mean, I hope very much uh, she will, the Prime Minister will give reassurance to people who are already here. It's very hard, frankly, to give reassurance for the future unless there's um, some very definitive statement made about the need for people to come in and work in the health service because otherwise we will actually have serious skill shortages within it. I'd just like to make a bigger <coughs> point, which is what I think is the key politically to winning this debate. You absolutely rightly talked about the pressures on the health service and on social care. The truth is, these are the challenges of the country today. But it wasn't simply a piece of rhetoric when I was saying the government is focused on Brexit to the exclusion of virtually everything else. It is. And by the way, because of the complexity of the negotiation and because the decision now is to get out of the single market and the customs union and therefore have to renegotiate all these preferential trade agreements, how could it not be? If you talk to anybody connected with government today, they will tell you of this vast exercise going on, pulling civil servants in from everywhere, trying to work out all the different dimensions of this, creating whole teams. They, Brexit is the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. It's it. So what a crisis like that in the health service and social care requires is a government focused on it requires a prime minister focused on it. You're not going to get that. And once people start to understand that that is also a cost of Brexit, it's not simply the cost in jobs or politics to do with Europe, it's the cost in focus on the issues that actually day to day make their lives better or worse. Believe me, when that linkage is made, then people are going to start reconsidering this. Because this isn't going to go on for a few months. Look, I talk to people who say to me about Brexit, you know, look, we took the decision. You just got to go and do it now. And why are you guys still talking about it? As if it was, as I say, a relatively simple matter of mechanics. It's not. We're going to be talking about it for years. In fact, we're going to be talking about not much else for years. So, okay, time to time, other things get a look in. But the theme that will run throughout the British government for the next years is Brexit. That is, I'm afraid, why they're not able to deal with it. Now, on the grassroots campaign, I think this is, I mean, I really applaud the work that you and others are, are doing. I think it's fantastic. And we need a combination of things. It's like any political campaign. You need to be on the detail, because every single thing that happens every step of the way has got to be analyzed. It's got to be, you know, for example, the it's great stuff put out by Open Britain by many other organizations. People like Nick Clegg, for example, do excellent briefs on what's happening day by day. But my view, very frankly, as a sort of you know, practicing politician, as it were, is you've got to get, you've got to get some coordination into this. Because right? otherwise, everyone's doing their bits and pieces, and that's fantastic. But you, know, you don't win a campaign like this unless there's some coordination. And then you need big strategic arguments which are shared in common. Right, I've just given one about the focus of the government, but you need to work those out. <coughs> and as for, no, I, I, I love the fact they now say it's, Brexit's really down to me. Um, uh, so um, let me just deal very simply with this question about, um, you know, the transitional arrangements. Yeah, we could have decided. The circumstances, of course, were completely different in 2004. We could have decided to put those transitional arrangements in. It would have meant for four years people could still come to Britain, by the way. Freedom of movement came in immediately. But it's true, they wouldn't have been able to look for a job, or at least not officially, which is one of our issues, by the way, until 2008. But actually, the majority of this migration from Europe has come in post-2008. So 
you know, I know it's very convenient for government ministers to say, oh, no, no, we, we, we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for him. Uh, you know, it's about time they took responsibility for being uh, in government, okay? So the other thing, though, I think is really important is this, and this is one of the things I find I didn't say too much, I just mentioned in my speech. But let me just say it to you now. How have we come to think that enlargement was <laughs> bad for Britain? Why, why do you think Britain fought for enlargement for these countries in Eastern Europe if they wanted to, to come in to the European <coughs> Union? We did it for big strategic interests of this country. It's in our interest that Europe takes in Eastern Europe. Those countries that have come in are now part of our security area. They're part of the European Union. Look at what's happened to the living standard in those countries. Compare Poland and Ukraine, right? When they left the, Sov the, the Soviet bloc, roughly the same GDP per head, you look at the difference now. It's in, it was in our interest to have enlargement. It's a good thing for Britain. Single market was what we fought for. And that's why I say, when you look at this debate today, there is a surreal quality to it. You know, as if these things that we fought for as a country for reasons that are really good. I mean, think what would be happening in Eastern Europe today. I mean, just think if these countries hadn't joined the European Union. Think the pressures they would be subject to. Some of them are subject to pressures anyway. Think how those pressures would be ramped up if they weren't in the European Union. So. These are important things that we need to remind people of when we come to this debate. Thank you. We'll come to a question at the front. Uh, Robert Nisbet from Sky News. How are you intending to... Oh, sorry, your microphone. Robert Nisbet from Sky News. Uh, you're talking about setting up a political movement and an institute, but how are you actually going to influence the debate? Are you talking about trying to get various political parties together to form perhaps a new political party? Uh, and are you looking for a second referendum? To that now. Yep, sure. Um, so, no, I'm not talking about a new political party. Um, and the issue of how a change of mind manifests itself is, in my view, a second order question. What I think we need to do is very, very simple. We need to create a sufficient understanding of what as we know the reality of Brexit, as we get to know it's not a claim, it's a this is what's going to happen, as the facts of Brexit become clear, we need to build sufficient understanding amongst the British people and a sufficient sense that, no, having looked at what we're now being offered, this is not such a good idea for us. And how you do that is the most important thing. What you then, how you then test that is another thing. But you know, it's going to become perfectly clear or not. I mean, it may not become clear, in which case what I'm saying will not succeed. But I think if we focus on persuading people, here is all the pain, and here, if immigration is the thing that worries you, this is actually all you're getting. <laughs> I, I know exactly why the Brexit um, ideologues don't want that debate to get underway, because if that happens, people are going to be scratching their heads and thinking, so we're getting all this misery and difficulty and challenge. We're getting a control of our immigration that's less than 12% of the total and doesn't actually affect the immigration we'd actually care most about. And what's more, we've got a government that's now a sort of obsessive about one issue, which is Brexit, and can't deal with all the issues that I care about. I think in those circumstances, people are going to start to scratch their heads and think about changing their mind. And that's what's important. And, you know, it, it, it is, look, obviously all of this would be easier if, if you were in a position where there was a, uh, an opposition party that looked capable of, of challenging the government for, for its position, which on the polling obviously is not the case at the moment. But nonetheless, this is a sufficiently big issue that I think part of what we're doing today and part of what we will do in the months to come is building the links so that you have a movement of people out there on the ground um, in the public debate saying, here are the facts, let's think again. And the second okay. referendum? No, as I say, I think that's a second order question. You could have a second referendum. 
You could do it in different ways, but that's not the issue. There's no point in even having a second referendum unless it's clear that, you know, it'll become clear from, I mean, there are lots of ways you can test opinion, okay? There'll be polls, there'll be members of parliament coming back from their constituencies saying, you know what, the mood on the doorsteps changed. So th this is what's important, is to create a different mood about this. Then you can decide, is it worth people having a, a second choice? But one of the reasons it's so important to have this movement is that right now, where's the pressure on the government? Right? The pressure's all one way. The pressure's from the right-wing cartel of papers who will beat them up and beat anyone up who dares suggest that anything other than Brexit at any cost is the right path of the country. So one actually very good thing for our democracy would be to put Theresa May and Philip Hammond and other people under pressure from people saying, hang on a minute, you know, this is, we're not for Brexit at any cost here. So I actually think they would benefit the government from having some countervailing pressures. Because at the moment, as far as I can see the politics, this is just one way. Thank you. Thank you. Carol Walker from the BBC. What do you say to the charge that your argument is fundamentally undemocratic? You're trying to overturn a vote of the British people. Isn't the only way you could do that through a second referendum? And if I may, do you really think that you're the one with the popular appeal to get a different answer if you did get a second go? Right. So, first of all, on, 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 on me, right, you can like the messenger or not like the messenger. And this is a free country, so I've got a right to speak and you've got a, the freedom to listen or not. Right? You don't want to listen to me? Don't listen to me. Um, but... So that's, you know, I'm very clear and simple on this. I know that there will be a volley of abuse <laughs> that will come my way for speaking, but I'm speaking because I believe in it and I care about the country. Um, I love this thing about the democratic, you know, it's undemocratic to, to carry on debating this. You know, the will of the people is not some fixed immutable thing that can never change, irrespective of the facts that are brought to their attention. When the people voted on June the 23rd, I accept entirely they voted to get out of Europe. But they didn't at that point know what the alternative was. They were told. That's, I've used this analogy before, but it's a very accurate one. It's like a house swap. They said, yep, we want to swap our house. But they hadn't seen the other one. They'd had one group of people tell them, this other house is fantastic, you should definitely move there. And another group of people say, no, it's a really bad idea, I wouldn't do that. So what do they do? They heard two people, they decided to go with the person who told them it was fantastic. But here's the thing, now they're going to go and see it. Right. Now they're going to go and visit the neighbourhood. Now they're going to go and test the structure. Now they're going to go and see whether it's the type of move they really want to make. The idea that in those circumstances, if they decide, you know what, I think this is not such a great neighbourhood, not really liking the structure, don't think it's got the right bedrooms for us and the facilities, it's going to cost too much to do it up. Uh, what, they can't change their mind? No, you made your decision. you just got to do it. No, stop debating it. Don't think about it anymore. <laughs> Boys, who made that rule? <laughs> I mean, it's just, this is, this is ridiculous. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid we have time for just one more question. So I'm going to take the gentleman with his hand up there. Hi, Arch Singh from the Press Association. Um, you claim to know what Brexit voters voted for um, in terms of immigration, um, and actually they were, they were more concerned about immigration from outside the EU, for example. I was just wondering, what, when was the last time you were on the doorstep and actually talked to some of these voters? Right, first of all, I'm not claiming that I know what people did, right? I'm simply going on what you see as the, you know, the overall position. I think most people would say, and it's true, I don't spend a lot of time now at least on the doorstep, but someone like Pat does, there are many other members of parliament here who do, and I think most people would say that immigration was a major question. Right. I also think when you talk to people about immigration, and I do by the way, I think their anxiety, I think, is as much, if not more, to do with non-EU immigration than it is to do with EU, EU immigration. But, you know, my point, again, is very simple. Okay, I'm not 
claiming that I have some great knowledge of what the British people think or they don't think, and I'm perfectly willing to accept that they voted in a referendum. They did vote in a referendum, 52 to 48 to leave. All I'm saying is a very, very simple thing. And this is the beginning of the, the debate, that if a significant part of that 52% show real change of mind, however you measure it, we should have the opportunity to reconsider this decision. Now, as I say, whether you do it through another referendum or another method, and that's a, that's a second order question. But this issue is the single most important decision this country has taken since the Second World War. And debate can't now be shut down about it. If Britain leaves Europe, I think the impact on Britain is bad. I think the impact on Europe is bad. I think the impact on the world is bad. We live at a moment of time, and I said this a little bit earlier, but I just want to end on this note because I, I believe it so strongly. We are going through a period of time when for the first time in my adult political lifetime, the issues to do with the basic values of liberal democracy are at risk. I want our country in that debate, standing up for what we believe, building new alliances, not breaking old ones, and playing its part for those reasons of character and history and alliance in making sure that argument turns out well. So I'm not, I'm not claiming any special knowledge of the British people. I'm simply claiming one right, not just for myself, but for others, and that's to carry on talking to them and carry on debating with them and carry on discussing with them so that if in the end we do decide to go down this path, which is effectively now Brexit at any cost. I mean, remember, you know, a few months ago, it was a question, would we stay in the single market? Now that went, oh, we'll lease the customs union. Now that's gone too. So let's not pretend that this thing is fixed. It's moving all the time. Right. So I just want that debate to continue so that if people decide in the end, okay, we, want, we care about this so much, we want Brexit at any cost, fair enough, we'll have lost the argument. But please don't tell us that we don't have the right to make that argument if we believe in this case strongly and if we believe that making this argument is profoundly in the interest of our country.